where Angry Video Game Nerd has been blasting bad games for almost 20 years now. Maybe even your favorite games got lambasted by the nerd. But are these games really so bad as the nerd makes out them to be? Welcome to Debunking the Nerd, where we analyze games featured in the AVGN series. We'll be taking a deep dive into the nerd's critique of the games and we'll see if these games are really that bad. Before we begin, we want to make clear that we love classic AVGN. This series is not a critique of James Rolfe, but a character he plays. With that out of the way, we have highlighted the following complaints for Castlevania 2. The first complaint we want to talk about is long transitions from day to night. But the first problem comes in when it changes from day to night. Why does it take so long? Nobody feels like sitting through this every time. Why did they think that that would be a good idea and interrupt the gameplay? Did they think it would be more realistic? I mean, in real life, I don't have to stop in my tracks when the sun sets and the box doesn't pop up in the air. It takes roughly 8.5 seconds to transition between day and night. While it disrupts the flow of the game a little bit, it isn't necessarily that bad. During the night, enemies become twice as stronger, Zombies roam the towns, and NPCs hide in their houses. It's difficult to think of another way to pull this off without the transition mechanic. Oh, and the nighttime music is a banger. The next complaint is losing a life when falling into water. And why do you have to die when you fall in the water? That's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Sometimes I don't feel like going down the stairs just to get down to ground level when I can just take a shortcut and jump down. But oops, I shouldn't do that. There might be water down there. And this guy can go all over fighting hordes of evil monsters, but he can't even f swim. The water pit is a well-known cliche in video games, so we don't really get why the nerd is baffled by this one. The nerd complains that it takes too long to buy weapons and items. Another thing that's really annoying about this game is the fact that you have to buy weapons and items. Here you have to collect hearts, which count as money. The items you need to buy are too f expensive, and the hearts don't add up enough. It takes too long to get enough of them to buy something, and it gets boring wandering around killing the same monsters over and over again. Let's do some calculations and see how many hearts we need to obtain to buy all the necessary items. In the starting town, you only need to buy holy water and the white crystal. Each costs 50 hearts. You already start with 50 hearts, so you need to collect only 50 for the other item. There is also a foreign whip for sale in this town, which costs 100 hearts. But this item can be skipped, as a better weapon will be available for sale in the next town you visit. The monsters in Jova Woods, which is located to the right of the town, Drop small hearts. A small heart is worth two hearts. The first night cycle comes fast in the game, roughly after one and a half minute of starting the game. During the night time, monsters get stronger. In addition to getting stronger, they now drop four hearts instead of two. The night cycle takes three minutes, and this is a good opportunity to collect a lot of hearts. Later in the game, monsters drop 8 hearts. In the second town, the town of Varus, you will have to spend 200 hearts in total. 50 for a dagger and 150 for a chain whip. In the town of Algiba, the only key item to buy is garlic, which costs 50 hearts. One purchase gives you 2 pieces, and this will be enough for the entire playthrough. There are 5 mansions to visit in the game. We need to purchase an oak stick from a vendor in each mansion, in order to hit the orb with it to obtain Dracula's body part. Each oak stick has the same price of 50 hearts, making a total of 250 hearts. The town of Ondol has a morning star for sale. This weapon upgrade costs 200 hearts. This is by far the most expensive purchase. But after this, there is really nothing else to buy, except for some laurels. That's 50 hearts for 2 pieces, although it is possible to get 8 laurels for free if you own a silk bag. The final amount adds up to 850 hearts. The hearts are easy to collect, as you will be collecting them all the time on your way from one town to another. While it may not be your thing to collect hearts and exchange them for items and weapons, Castlevania 2 doesn't require you to collect an exorbitant amount. 
This leads us to the next complaint, which is losing hearts when dying. When you die, you lose all your hearts and you have to start all over again. You lose all your hearts only when you get a game over. The player starts with 3 lives and there are multiple churches throughout the game, where you can replenish your health. Additionally, leveling up restores your health. Even if you lose all your hearts, it doesn't take too long to build your way back up. The blocks you can fall through complaint is a one that we fully agree on with the nerd. One of the worst things in the game are the pitfalls, which are areas where there's like stones or blocks that look like you could walk on them, but instead you just fall through. It's impossible to tell where these spots are the first time walking through, so you just have to keep throwing holy water all over to see where they are. It's retarded. Why should I have to do that? The first batch of fake blocks are located in Berkeley Mansion, the first mansion to visit in the game. You're just casually going through the mansion, killing monsters on the way, you take a jump and you go through. Needless to say, these first fake blocks instill a feeling of paranoia in you for the rest of the game. From now on, you'll be spamming holy water to check for fake blocks everywhere you go. In our opinion, the game could have done without the fake blocks, as it needlessly extends the gameplay. Speaking of extending the gameplay, the developers could have added boss fights at the end of every mansion, instead of the fake blocks. In the dungeons, there's no bosses at the end, which is a big disappointment. Here, they just got lazy and only put a few bosses in the game and left some of the dungeons just empty, like this one. We agree with the nerd that having no bosses at the end of mansions is disappointing, especially for Castlevania, a series that is known for its boss fights at the end of every stage. To be more precise, Castlevania 2 has a few boss fights. The game has only three bosses though, and the fights are anticlimactic, to say the least. Camilla's Spirit, which is a very easy fight. Basically stand a bit to the side and wait for the boss to come close to get in some hits. It's easy to run past the boss, however this boss cannot be skipped as it holds the magic cross, a key item which is needed to cross the barricade on the bridge to Dracula's castle. The Reaper is also an easy fight. Here's what the Reaper fights looked like in Castlevania 1 and 3. If you entered the Reaper fight in the first Castlevania without the Holy Water sub-weapon, you were in for a difficult fight. The Reaper fight in Castlevania 3, although it has two forms, is easier, but still can be challenging. And here's what the Reaper fight looks like in Castlevania 2. Don't want to fight the Reaper? No problem. We'll cover the Dracula fight in a later complaint. The infamous tornado part is arguably the most notorious part of the game. For many people, it is the first thing that comes to mind when Castlevania 2 is mentioned. Would you guess that you're supposed to pass through this wall? You have to kneel down by it for like 10 seconds. You need to have a red crystal selected and be kneeling down and wait a little while before this magic tornado comes and takes you to the next part of the game. At one point in the game, you get to a dead end called Deborah's Cliff. What you need to do here is to equip the red crystal and kneel. After a few seconds, a tornado appears and takes you away to another part of the map. How are you supposed to figure all of this out? Well, there's a clue in one of the mansions that instructs you to do this. The only problem is that the clue was translated poorly in the English version of the game. We can see that in the Japanese version of the game the clue is pretty straightforward, whereas the English version is confusing. We are with the nerd on this particular complaint. The poor translation leads us perfectly to the next complaint, the cryptic clues. Most of the townspeople have things to say which aren't important at all. The text itself seems to be one of the main issues. Not just spelling errors, but the information too. It seems like they're giving you clues, but they never make any sense and most of the time they're just flat out lies. We have analyzed all the clues in the game and here's what we found. Clues marked in green are useful. Yellow clues walk the line between useful and garbage. And red, which is the absolute majority, garbage clues. The useful clues consist mostly of directions. Some contain information about the items. 
The yellow category consists of clues that are somewhat helpful and at the same time confusing. And there's of course the bad clues. All these clues do not make any sense, as they were lost in the translation. We fully agree with the nerd on this complaint. While we're at the topic of discussing the clues, let's take a look at the next complaint, which is skippable clues. Here in the dungeons, there's books that you may find which actually give you clues about things in the game that you may need to know about. But when I find these books half the time, it's by accident, so I may hit the button and cancel it out, which means that I don't even get to read it and I don't have a second chance. As shown by the nerd, you can accidentally skip these clues. Despite the majority of this being useless, this is still bad game design. Let's take a look at the final complaint. So, say we enter the code and we go to Dracula's castle. You'll be pretty disappointed how anticlimactic this game is. First of all, there's no enemies in Dracula's castle. The only obstacles are just like going up and down steps. Dracula's way too easy. So, you have managed to get to Dracula's castle. After all the wandering around, after all the fake blocks, and after all the misleading clues, you're finally here. You got a lot of pent-up rage, which you will gladly release on Dracula himself. Dracula and his cronies best be ready, because you mean business. No matter what the castle throws at you, you are ready. Except the castle is empty. For some reason, the developers didn't bother to add any enemies or platforming at the final location at all. You just go all the way through the empty castle, up to Dracula's chamber for the final showdown. The fight itself couldn't be any easier. You just need to spam the sacred flame and that's it. There's an even faster way. You can use the gold knife sub weapon. This concludes our analysis of the nerds' complaints. Some of the complaints we analyzed are legit, while others aren't. Is the game as bad as the nerd says, however? In our opinion, no. Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest, tried to experiment with a new genre of games, known today as Metroidvania. It paved the way for Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which in turn inspired the development of games such as Hollow Knight, Blasphemous, Axiom Verge, and many others. The game itself has impressive graphics, one of the best soundtracks on the NES, and a great atmosphere. We recommend giving Castlevania 2 a try, especially if you like games like Metroid or The Legend of Zelda. Thank you for watching until the end. This was an idea that we wanted to do for quite some time now, and we hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one.